Anyway, the last time I walked into this room uh, was almost exactly three years ago to the day. Uh, I was escorted by the U.S. Ambassador to the Court of St. James. Um, we came through that side door over there. Uh, this room was full of many press and architects and others, and it was for the announcement of the competition winning entry design of the um, new U.S. Embassy in London, which is uh, approaching about 90% uh, completion of the documentation. And no, I'm not going to show it tonight. Um, I think Will, Will might have mentioned that uh, you might may or may not be seeing that. Um, uh, but I remember walking into this room uh, and um, now I can recognize the four walls. Um, at that particular point, it was a complete and total blur. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Andrew uh, for hosting uh, this uh, symposium down in Washington at the Billing Center, uh, to Michael and Will for organizing the conference uh, and the exhibition. Uh, and for allowing us to uh, participate uh, in, the, uh, uh, in this uh, as well. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I want to talk a little bit about what I call thinking ahead, uh, my, our context for prototyping architecture. Um, and uh, I, I apologize in advance for the sort of inflated title here, but you know, sometimes you have to sort of do that just to kind of get your um, get your place down uh, and your and your thoughts down. Um, but what I want to talk about is um, first, just briefly, a little bit. This afternoon, we saw snippets of history of uh, prototyping. I want to talk a little bit about that history uh, briefly. Then talk about a culture of prototyping. Uh, and then after that, um, briefly touch on five principles, what we call five principles of prototyping that, that we have been pursuing. Um, so most of you, if not all of you, are architects. And most of us all, I think, begin here. Um, and it's about the nature of, of making something. And most of the time, you know, most of us have been trained as architects to think about it in terms of just simply in a kind of reductive way of form. You know, and it's art and science coming together. And over the years, over the many years of, of architecture, you know, that has been more or less interpreted as more art and less science, or more science and less art, but sometimes in equilibrium. Now, uh, in the 21st century, late 20th century, 21st century, it's about, we think, performance. And I, I'm not going to use the uh, performative aspects of what some presented this afternoon about the sort of act of getting to uh, making architecture, if you will, or uh, the process of that, but the actual performance of what we make is really, really, truly important in this day and age. And it's become more so than it ever it was, um, given the environmental um, issues that we, we now face. And so above that diagram is a little crossed out diagram of a building uh, crossing out the formula of quality times time equals uh, cost time, quality times scope equals cost times time. And we talk about that in uh, refabricating architecture. And what it shows is, uh, a redefined uh, uh, equation of more scope and more quality uh, for either the same amount of cost and time or less cost and time, all managed by environmental responsibility. And so that, that mandate is something that we're all facing as architects and that we have to have, to have in our minds as we make things. So how do we get there? How do we get to form and how do we get to performance? And I think Steve and I uh, in our office have talked a little bit about this and, and other things that we've, we've written and made. But um, in this particular case, we're calling it pre-form or before form. 
uh, and the, the sort of messy vitality, the messy uh, process of inquiry to get to form uh, that helps us then define that form and then helps us refine that form uh, into something that can be performative. So that's where prototyping and mock-ups um, come in. Uh, you know, it's really about this first phase, about the acts that go on ahead of uh, actually design and completion that, uh, and that inquiry about that, that really form the basis, I think, of mock-ups and prototyping. So I always think it's really a good thing to begin with a definition, and I have actually two definitions because interchangeably throughout architecture there have been uh, several terms thrown about, um, and we've heard some of them this afternoon. Mot one being mock up, and I'll let you read the Wikipedia. Um, I, I went to the lowest brow uh, definition here, um, uh, just so that we wouldn't have any arguments about it. Um, um, but in this particular case, I think um, there are a couple of factors about, about uh, mock-up that I think are, are important. Um, one is that they refer to it in manufacturing or design, um, that it's about scale or often full-size model, uh, and they talk about it as a device used for teaching, demonstration, design evaluation, promotion, or other purposes. Uh, and then they go on to say that it's a prototype if it provides at least part of the functionality of a system and enables testing of a design. And so we've, we saw a lot of that this afternoon, a little bit in the seven talks uh, this afternoon, ranging from you know, an exploration of different kinds of craft through uh, a variety, even uh, a talk by Alan uh, Dempsey a, 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 about a search for a process and a, and a search of uh, a couple of approaches toward uh, prototyping. Um, and I, I found that very interesting to sit through those, uh, those talks this afternoon. Not the least of which, by the way, when you come into an academic uh, paper presentation, most everybody stayed on time this afternoon, which was also a very, very good thing. Um, so mock-up is one thing, um, and then prototype is yet another way of looking at this. And you, you know you can run these back and forth in your mind, but a prototype as an early sample or model built to test a concept or process, um, or to act as a thing to be replicated or learned from, and and then they go on to define it in you know, a world of other kinds of contexts, you know, design, electronics, software programming, and so forth. But I think what's interesting here is prototyping, again, defined as prototyping serves to provide specifications for a real working system rather than a theoretical one. So here we are with mock-up and prototype um, really in some ways coming <laughs> together because we're t trying to develop uh, an act uh, and a thing toward uh, a completion of something um, that um, is, um, moves from primitive form to something that ultimately becomes refined uh, and, um, and, uh, uh, and developed. Now, I'll jump to this just briefly because I want to get it out of the way. I think one of the very, very first principles of prototyping is absolutely about this, about failing early and failing fast. Oftentimes I think, particularly architects, think about prototyping as gaining success or trying to get to something of refinement and um, looking for success. I think we, in Kieran Timberlake, tend to use prototypes to fail early and fail often because that's how you reduce risk. And prototypes should be about reducing your risk and about refinement. Um, but ultimately, if you don't fail, if you don't test something to failure, then you probably missed the opportunity to really understand where that failure point really is. And I, I use the F-35 uh, plane here that's being developed by our own US military 
uh, across uh, the Marines, the Navy, um, uh, a, and, and the uh, Air Force, a, a kind of a Swiss Army knife of an airplane um, that ultimately will be sold probably worldwide, but it is now the most expensive plane in the world because the military didn't fail early and fail fast, and they kept larding on uh, operations onto this particular uh, this particular plane, and it's now in you know multiple cost overruns. It doesn't fly well. Um, it um, it certainly can't be used for combat, um, um, but it it looks really damn good. Um, um, so I won't talk about failing early and failing fast much again, but I wanted to get that out of the way. Now somebody here talked a little bit about this this afternoon, and I don't know if it was Alan or somebody else, but you know, Henry Ford, uh, you know, when you start talking about cars, and you'll, you'll hear Mark White talk tomorrow um, in this same time slot if you come back about Land Rover um, and, and the development, but Henry Ford was a prototyper. And the Model T went through 26 iterations of, of models before they got to the Model T. And no, the T is not the 26th letter in the alphabet. He just picked that out of you know, whatever you know, was the sort of succession of sub-prototypes and prototypes along the way. But I, I gave you this caption along, this, along the edge there that um, he talks about um, you know, designing a Model T engine right in our experimental room and, and not forgetting that. Uh, people thought that you couldn't build an engine with a removable cylinder head, which wasn't going to leak. Um, you know, but they tested it on another model before they decided to send it out in production, you know, uh, along the way. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think 27 million Model Ts were made in its lifetime was because it was such, it was so, they had failed early and failed fast, and the success of this thing was here was truly the jackknife of all cars, you know, power sources on farms and so forth and so on. He had really found that sort of universal teep, if you will, that um, you know, uh, you know, went across uh, a, a wide range of platforms. And then, of course, you get again. We we heard mention of Buckminster Fuller this afternoon. His attempt to think about how you move from top to bottom here in terms of designing an automobile and how that you know, morphed uh, over time. You know, each and every one really not thought about in terms of a production model in the way that, that uh, Henry Ford was thinking about, but, but really trying to advance the, the theory and design of, of, of automobile making. And then, of course, I think we heard somebody else, Eve or somebody else this afternoon talk about prototyping in service of refinement, and I think the BMW, you know, or many other high-end automobiles are really examples of that, you know, continuous refinement, you know, where, you know, yes, there are elements of prototyping along the way, but um, by the time it gets to you and me out on the street and in the showroom, uh, that act of prototyping is, 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 you know, back in the shop. Uh, someplace, and we're not we're not actually um, experiencing uh, experiment uh, any longer. Now, let me back. Let's morph and move from automobiles and cars, which I, I love to talk about, but to, to architecture. And I take you now back in history to the 14th and 15th century, and you think about prototyping and mock-ups in terms of you know the tools given to architects to use and. A great example is this. Um, I think one to uh, three, you know, one to one quarter scale model of uh, the um, uh, St. Peter's Dome. You know, many, many of these were built in order to not only understand it in three dimensional form uh, by carpenters, you know, working with Michelangelo and others, but. Uh, but also to explain it to the Pope at the time. And so these become these very, very first sort of acts of mock-up or prototyping because they were big enough to understand and big enough to kind of explain to somebody else the th sort of first three-dimensional models, if you will, 
uh, moving from perspectival drawing to something that was more tangible and more understandable to the to the to the uh, to the layperson. And then, of course, you get Perret uh, in the 19th century, who is trying to imagine architecture in a very very different way. Um, you know, here, you know, kind of tipping. Uh, a space up and looking at it very differently so that it becomes something that allows him to think experimentally about how to make space in a very, very, uh, very, very unusual and different kind of way. Uh, Banham talks about this in his book and, and I think in the, in the context of it um, really, you know, explains the sort of nature of the tools that are, you know, used by architects to um, make and develop architecture uh, and, and, and design. And then, of course, you have our own 20th century methodologies of making models, you know, this being hand built, plexiglass, you know, other materials and so forth, but large enough, you know, that a lay person could actually this model split apart. You could actually see the inside uh, of, this, of this particular project. Um, and then, of course, um, we heard a lot of conversation this afternoon about three-dimensional printing and, and prototyping, uh, you know, we can spit models out um, quite rapidly now with, you know, with, um, you know, within two to three to four hours, uh, you know, looking at different relationships, different forms, different uh, components. Um, and this object, which happens to be, you know, roughly paper-sized and maybe, you know, uh, you know, 150 tall, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, you can also make components, you know, that um, begin to prototype actual pieces of buildings as details uh, in, in the construction that you're actually designing. So you, you can jump scales very, very rapidly with this tool. And then, of course, we have all the other digital, you know, uh, opportunities to use and explain to ourselves and to our engineers and consultants and to our late uh, lay people how things come together. Uh, this urban project in Philadelphia that's quite complex and under, under and next to our city hall and has subways running uh, uh, each way and pedestrian concourses and all that. There's no real way to understand it in plan section and elevation any longer and there's no real way to understand it as a, th as a physical model. So you have to use the digital tools that are available to you um, to, you know, both walk through them, uh, imagine them, and re-explain them along the way. And each and every one of these becomes a mock-up, if you will, or a prototype in the lexicon of what we're, how we're making things and how we're trying to explain them and communicate them uh, going on. And then they move to a different scale. And this is part of that project. And these are actually full-scale component uh, uh, mock-ups in this particular case of uh, both metal joints um, that help to carry this uh, uh, laminated glass canopy uh, and also uh, interface and resolve a very complex series of details um, that you might pass by as you're going down into the concourse from the upper upper plaza and it, you know, there becomes a moment where that three-dimensional uh, drawing tool and that three-dimensional uh, scale model tool does not inform you in terms of what you're trying to make and so again you, you jump scales and, you, and you, you make it out of something else and it may be out of the real material as you see on top you know, fully welded, fully, you know, fully uh, completed in terms of um, in terms of finish, or it may be made up of, of substitutable materials that are quite ephemeral, uh, such as cardboard and foam and uh, things that are easy to cut but come together quite rapidly and allow you to make these kinds of things. And then there's the, the prototype or the mock-up in service of, of a product that um, ultimately, ultimately becomes a building element like this vanity um, you know, that we did now almost eight years ago, but, um, you know, uh, still resides in our office that, you know, is being used in a variety of applications and is continuously refined, not unlike the BMW or the Model T in the sense that it, 
it gets um, it gets revisited and refined um, every time it gets inserted. Uh, the nature of understanding different kinds of uh, systems and how they can come together in a in a uh, urban loft initiative uh, as three dimensional uh, elements and templates, uh, and then you have the prototype or the or the the opportunity for the layperson to actually mock something up, and you get to a website that actually allows you. It's a configuration tool developed in this particular case by Living Homes, who we have designed for. And you can go on this configuration to essentially design your house and then also understand how, how sustainable it might be and what its life cycle costs might be. And that, in turn, becomes a communication tool back to somebody who might actually order this, this, this particular house off of a website um, uh, you know, and allows them to you know, configure different materials and different relationships uh, you know, going forward. So, let me move from that sort of broad, you know, brush historical uh, survey to talking a little bit about a culture of prototyping. And then I want to move to these um, five um, principles. Um, you know, the art of mock-ups, prototypes as building blocks, which we heard a little bit about this afternoon, singular <laughs> prototypes as proofing theory or as advancing theory, um, simulation is prototyping because we have that tool and that ability to now simulate uh, in a way that we didn't have even 10 years ago. And then there's the whole notion of, I think, trying to get to perfect um, simulation then informed by verification, which allows for, you know, a kind of continual uh, refinement um, over time. So the culture of prototyping, you know, we'll just use our our office as an example. We, um, you know, many offices are organized uh, the way this Venn diagram is organized with, you know, technology and workplace and staffing and finances and public relations all serving something, a goal, you know, whatever the partner's goals might be. In our case, you know, we like to design, innovate, and invent. And at the core of what we do, we like to say is research. And um, we can define that research in a variety of ways. Is it design research? Is it is it pure research in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a definable sense? I think it's research in service of everything else that you see in this Venn diagram. So that research, you know, uh, you know, might be about you know doing a deeper take on public re relations, or it might be a, a very deep research on on uh, things that are related to staffing or technology, but in, ultimately it's, it's the service that we produce um, and it's in service of design, innovating, and inventing. And then you take that research, which is in a variety of different camps, but it basically falls into kind of two categories, project-centered research and product-centered research that are, um, you know, uh, sometimes overlap and sometimes jump and leap over one another uh, as projects get developed uh, in the office. We're an ISO certified firm, international standards organization certified. I think we're only one of a couple in the United States, maybe a couple of other engin engineering firms are as well. Um, it's unusual in the United States to be ISO certified. It's not so unusual here not so unusual to be so in Europe or even in parts of Asia. Um, but that culture of prototyping is actually served by being ISO certified because we have to map our processes. Our, our team, you know, um, which involves environmental researchers, material scientists, electrical engineers, st a structural engineer, um, some architects, um, you know, and a variety of uh, software uh, engineers all work together collaboratively in our office and are in service um, not only of those product-centered research projects but also the, the product-centered research projects that they are taking on and they work interchangeably uh, throughout the office. And I spoke of that ISO certification. Here's just one page of but 48 of these processes that we've mapped in our office. Um, the research project um, and there are a couple of components that I think are really important to point out here. In a culture of prototyping, that process becomes 
you need to be thorough. You need to document what you're doing. You need to, you need to understand where you failed and where you're succeeding and how those things are, are recorded <coughs> along the way. And so we begin with what we call a red report, a research and environmental design report that um, has a scope to it, has a has a has an uh, you know um, uh, an outline to it, and it might be as simple as trying to understand what the uh, environmental conditions are in Jaipur, India, you know, for a project, or in London, England, um, as opposed to you know what components might be uh, appropriate to assemble, uh, you know, for a certain kind of. Um, uh, research uh, uh, inquiry. The research query then uh, is developed out of that. It's a, it's a question, you know, or a series of questions that are uh, help guide, you know, the way forward. And they are, they are not, they're not static, they are mutable. They are, um, they are, you can find the answer to those queries, but they continue to develop additional questions. And then, of course, out of that uh, comes a research proposal. And the team, this is uh, depicted, um, you know, the dots represent, kind of represent, you know, a person in our office, we're now 100 people. Um, but uh, in the office, you can imagine how different teams come together to solve each one of these problems. And you see in the lower uh, left-hand corner, you know, day one, the research uh, uh, report begins, but it involves not only some environmental researchers and others in that team, but some architects as well. Um, as that moves along, there are questions and queries posed um, that other people might have expertise in that collaboratively and holistically uh, engage in that particular query. Uh, and then it morphs out of, you know, perhaps part of a team to, uh, a, a different kind of question about, uh, in this particular case, how does the structural glass connection perform at the plaza perimeter and, and where that might happen uh, and who that might happen with in, in our team. And then it moves back, uh, you know, as this uh, process develops um, and moves along, uh, you know, in, engaging uh, different people at different times. And I, I depicted different, different projects up at the top and different queries along the way just as a kind of way of simulating how that, that process begins to work uh, in our office. And these are some of the technologies that we've integrated, some of the architecture that's been created, and some of the outcomes that have come out of that particular process. And this is but a small sampling of some of the things that uh, we've been able to do. But we get to deep drilling. And I think one of the things that the research group has enabled us to do is collaboratively and quite, quite broadly and also quite narrowly get to some very, very deep drilling. This isn't sort of skimming Google and trying to find the answer on the third page. This is really getting to the answers that data uh, and verification and monitoring and measuring and uh, some of the other elements that are tools in our architect's quivers really are used, you know, we can use in order to inform the kind of architecture that we're going to make. Now, I'm intrigued by this diagram because, you know, we made it um, after uh, reading uh, a, a, a book by James Marston Fitch called American Buildings and the Historical Forces That Shaped It. And um, I think I have the date wrong. I but this says 1948, but I don't quite believe it. Uh, but it could be. Um, so let me just read uh, a passage from this. Um, it goes, he, he's, this is in chapter five. It's called The Golden Leap. Um, and he's talking about the 19th century and three great developments in structural theory. And he goes on to say, historically, the three factors, theory, material, and technique, have seldom been in exact equilibrium at, even, at any given moment. That is, there have been a few times when a lag in one did not prevent advance in the others. Occasionally, however, under the accumulating pressure of social change, a structure appears in which all three factors have combined at a high level to produce a radically new type. And he goes on to say um, that 
To borrow a term from the anthropologist, there has been a leap forward. Such structures were the palace, the bridge, and the tower. Now, we could all probably argue whether or not those were the great leaps forward, but more, what was more interesting to us was this convergence of theory, material, and technique coming together to make the kind of golden leap. We expanded to this. And I talk, you know, I've, I've talked a little bit earlier about how this is a holistic process. This is everything's all in from day one. You know, it's not a formal process. It's not form over function or function over form. It's all in, all the ingredients. You can't make a cake if you don't have all of those ingredients in, in the same place. Because one, the cake won't rise or it won't bake or it'll taste like crap or, you know, whatever. You know, it's, it, you have to have all the ingredients there. And so some of those ingredients include performance and people and program and time and form and structure and complexity and money, you know. And we heard that this afternoon, you know, trying to prototype to precision but also realizing that something might cost 100 pounds as opposed to costing 10 pounds and where that falls in the equilibrium of being accepted socially, um, you know, in, in the sort of nature of buying something. So you have to have all of these things working together and not permeate one over the other. They eventually self-permeate. They eventually, one by one, become, by the goals of the project, become a little more important than something else. The environmental factors might be a little higher than, for instance, the cost to make those kinds of things or to incorporate those envir environmental factors within the building and so forth. So here's but one example. And I, show, I told you I wouldn't show you the, the uh, New London Embassy, but I am showing you a couple of diagrams from the New London Embassy. You can see here the deficit based upon the program that we have in order to meet LEED and BREM, both of which are required by this particular project. But it's a deep hole. There's a baseline deficit, and this is just due to the uh, program of the building that put us in an environmental hole before we can even design anything. So how do we get out of that hole environmentally? Well, it has to be through a series of incremental steps that add up to uh, you know, a much broader outcome and then allow us to get to the cumulative energy strategies that meet the lead and bram high standards and energy targets that we're going to meet. And you can see only some of them have to do with the facades. A lot of them have to do with the operational aspects of the building. How do we understand those? Well, we had to understand them in the context of cost and life cycle performance and a variety of other things as well. So it's not just form making any longer. It's not just, you know, we put some prickly ETFE on the outside of a building and slap some, slap some uh, photovoltaics on it, call it, call it uh, high outstanding. No, it's about, it's about how all of these things are working holistically together and whether or not they actually work and whether or not they actually perform. Uh, and they, you can see that the project goals at the top are also informed by the other considerations uh, you know, and factors. And they, in this particular case, you, you have to meet, you know, 80 to 90 percent of those things and you have to accept the risks on those other uncertainties um, that are either definable or undefinable going forward. As we move forward then, you, you evaluate components of that building. I wouldn't call this necessarily a mock-up process or a prototyping process, it's simply an evaluation process. It's simply taking those things that are available to us and understanding what the, uh, what, what, what the circumstances are in terms of trying to get to the clearest glass possible given the layup that we have. The, the prototype there is probably the test bed that we created. <coughs> that rack that you see out of the same material that you see our, our uh, lob lolly prototype up on top, the Bosch Ruxroth frame, that probably is a prototype because you know, many of you here could probably use that same thing. And if we, if we refined it uh, and put it out in the marketplace, it might actually have some uh, other usefulness other than ourselves. But in the end, um, it's all about evaluating the product and trying to get to an answer 
uh, and an outcome. And then ultimately, I think there's a responsibility here of a culture of prototyping. I think this, this conference is a little bit about this. It's about sharing ideas. It's about conveying information and getting it out into the marketplace so that others can learn from it. And I think that's one of the things that we've attempted to do is not hold these things to ourselves and say, look how cool we are. You know, we've, you know, we invented this new thing, but you can't have it. What we've tried to do is, you know, share these thoughts um, and that research uh, uh, quite broadly. So let me talk about those five principles um, of, of mock-ups and prototypes. The first I call the art of the mock-up. Um, the prototypes is building blocks. Um, and you could argue, well, you know, it's, this is more about mock-up than it is about prototype. And I, I personally probably make that definition between a mock-up being something that's really, you know, material that's being evaluated. Uh, I think, I, as somebody put it this afternoon, you know, that is available, you know, from a catalog or that you're trying to tweak into a more bespoke way um, that you're trying to put on a building um, rather than something that actually needs uh, a, a redesign uh, and, and a continual refinement uh, along the way. So this particular uh, series of images that you'll see leading to this new research laboratory at Rice U University uh, in Houston that we just completed begins in our office. These are done in our shop. We've got a very large shop. Um, we can pour concrete in there. We can weld. We can three-dimensionally print. We can, you know, uh, do a variety of uh, different things. But this was the assembly of the ceramic rods and the glass block and the uh, and the layup, initial layup of uh, uh, the glass block at the base of the building uh, in our office. Um, and, you know, using that before we even show a client, you know, the idea of the building, um, you know, using that as a means of trying to refine and understand exactly what we're going to see when we go to build one of these, which is a glass layup, uh, a, a sample of some fritting, uh, and, you know, three um, mock-up walls that were uh, developed to not only test the construction but also look at the arrangements of the uh, ceramic uh, rods and the backup material behind that on the south uh, facade of the building. Um, and these ultimately were the first things that the clients saw. They saw these things basically tested to fail. In other words, they were you know, they weren't the right proportion, they weren't the right layup, uh, you know, the, the contractor didn't know how to put it together. Um, we, you know, adjusted the specifications, we tuned the material, and then we built a full-scale mock-up of, uh, of a section of, a, of the building. You can see the building under construction in the background. This is sitting up on a steel frame on the campus in the light conditions that you would normally get in that in that environment to evaluate, you know, not only the performance of the of the south wall, but the fretted uh, east and west walls, and then of course uh, the glass on the north wall. And here you see that completed uh, 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 west southwest facade, uh, one of the entry portals, uh, and a detail of that. And let me tell you, if we had asked the contractor to do this for the first time in the field, it would have been an absolute mess. I would not be standing up here in front of you being proud of this building because they, they just, the very first two and three times that they put these materials together. And we have a, we have a construction problem in the U.S. that you don't quite have here. Um, there's, a, there's a, it's not a skill problem so much as it is um, you know, a, a, an appreciation of what the end result needs to be from the skilled trades. And that sense of craft and that sense of high performance here is at, at a very different standard than in the U.S. And it's at a very different standard in parts of, of, of Europe and in Asia than in the U.S. And, um, and so going through that mock-up and prototyping process is a way of moving past some of those constructional issues that ultimately then would be 
uh, end up as what we call punch lists or a brief at the end of the project that you know chronicles all the things that are wrong visually and mechanically with the way things are made um, and we ask the contractor to correct them at their cost and we try to avoid those because you know in 1999 before we uh, became ISO certified and before we wrote Refabricating Architecture and before we went through this mock-up and prototyping process, trust me, some of those briefs were three binders full. I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of flaws in buildings that we just, you know, we, you know, we, would, we would get done doing and it had nothing to do with our drawings or our specifications. It had everything to do with the mechanical making of the building. So here you see that detail. Here you see that other side of the mock-up with the, the frit um, uh, uh, of the physics pattern on the, on the north-facing glass. And here you see that, that north-facing glass um, in its reality, having studied the vision light, having studied the, the, um, the spandrel light, and having studied the, the scale of the frit over those, those elements um, in, in the light conditions. We now know what we're going to get so that the first time we see it in real life, we're not surprised by it. We're, 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 we're thrilled, you know, because it, it, it actually does what we asked it to do uh, and performs better than that. But it, in the end, we've understood these phenomenons and we've left, you know, less to chance, um, you know, um, so that we can achieve the quality uh, and the outcome that we've imagined. And here it is changing in different light. And I would say, arguably that this was the one moment that we hadn't studied, which is dusk, uh, you know, with a blue sky and the sun having gone down and that facade having changed entirely in color. And, and now you're surprised and, and wonderfully so. So let's talk about singular prototypes as proofing theory, okay? We wrote a book called Refabricating Architecture and upstairs you see a mock-up. Uh, or a prototype of a house called La Wally House. And that, that um, book has now been published worldwide and um, it rivals some other little red books on a Chinese shelf uh, uh, in a very large country as well um, uh, and is in Korea, um, Korean as well. Um, but the theory was that off-site fabrication could be done in a variety of different methodologies and that off-site fabrication um, might involve hybrid technologies, not just shipping space, but involve different relationships of parts coming together at different times. Um, and so here you see that mock-up in our shop. Um, uh, uh, and what this was proved to do was to try and understand how all these dissimilar materials might actually come together and how it might look, but also how they might come together uh, in, a, in a kind of sector of the building so that we could, uh, that sector being something that as a cross section across La Valley House was quite repetitive um, um, so that we could understand the nature of its refinement uh, and its scale uh, coming together. And then of course, a lot of the prototyping, if you will, a lot of the failing early and failing fast happened through the aegis of a three dimensional model as we heard today, you know, that you, you can debug nearly everything in a three-dimensional model. You can fix all the bus here before you have any bus on site. And so the frame design, the frame going up uh, on the platform out there, and then the chunks that were CNC uh, cut and fabricated um, uh, you know, off of our three-dimensional model are framed uh, and then uh, shipped to site and placed. And then returning back to a moment, I wish I should have taken a picture of the mock-up and the prototype and the drawing and the reality all together, and I'll remember to do that next time. Um, but if you compare this slide with what's upstairs, I mean, there's a, it, it's, a, it's virtually you know, a flawless one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one representation of one another. And in the end, you know, you can take a business card up there and try to slip it in between the cartridge of that, of that frame and the frame itself, and it barely fits. And that was the tolerance that we were trying to achieve in the mock-up. And of course, we were, we were dealing with much smaller bits, 
you know, a, a much more manageable kit making a mock-up. But in the end, the theory is proof because these things can come together um, in a way because we've, we've solved all, all of the relationship issues uh, that you can't see uh, behind the scenes in the three-dimensional mo model and in the, in the mocking up <coughs> of, of the prototype. And then, of course, the final proof of concept is obviously for architects, in our opinion, is, you know, can it be used? And is it, is it you know, does it meet the standards of uh, firmness, common, commodity, and delight? You know, um, its usefulness uh, along the way. And I think the jury's not out on this. I think from a, from a, uh, Worldwide uh, viewpoint, this that house has achieved wide acclaim. In terms of advancing theory, so we're not now proofing theory; we're trying to advance the theory. I moved to cellophane house, um, another house, another manageable, you know, opportunity and object. And you can understand why architects have used houses over the years as a, a means of, you know, developing their ideas um, and and trying to trying to explain you know, uh, uh, their designs to people. In this particular case, um, there are lots of factors going on here. This was an invited uh, opportunity to deliver something in a very, very short time at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and then have it up there for five and a half months, and then take it down after, after uh, that five and a half month period uh, we had to remove it from the site within about three and a half weeks. So obviously it called for being off-site constructed. It called for you know, uh, doing the vast majority of the advancement of construction somewhere else. But Steve and I and the firm really wanted to also advance the, no the, the notion that a house could be highly sustainable and that that sustainability is not just about a seat of the pants sustainability, but actually measured in life cycle costs and the kind of re return on embodied energy. And here you see our, the efforts from our research uh, having advanced those choices of materials and the embodiment of that uh, in this particular building uh, and the net recovery we think we would make from a, a cellophane house um, either as a repurposed uh, element as another house or as a recycled object uh, either way. So this is how it came together. It was you know, kitted together to be ch in chunks, um, delivered to the site, which you'll see in a minute, uh, and brought together. And in that way, it was designed for assembly and also designed for disassembly uh, as well. And so here's one of the very first prototyping elements. It, this particular building was to be built out of aluminum, aluminum frame like the Bosch Rexroth uh, extrusions upstairs. But instead, we were using polycarbonates, uh, resin panels, and uh, PET uh, uh, film, um, trying to do a, a second generation smart wrap exterior, uh, an energy gathering uh, element that we worked on in, in uh, 2004 that incorporated um, a variety of different materials on it. But here, those panels were going to get inserted into the building frame and they had to be, uh, we had to figure out a way of capturing that material and we had to, and fastening it, um, but also, um, you know, making sure that it was going to be strong enough. And here you see somebody who's about 175 pounds who's jumping on it like a trampoline. Um, you know, um, we found an ability to capture that material into the Bosch Rex Ross system uh, and weather seal it but also get it so taut that basically it became almost drum-like uh, uh, and it, it formed one but five um, skin elements in the exterior wall of the building. And here you see a full-scale um, mock-up of that wall and part of the frame of the photovoltaics now deployed on the PET and uh, in this particular case three of the five PET layers it was a passively ventilated uh, uh, chambered wall um, with the PET, the uh, photovoltaics on the on the inside layer of the first, um, the second, the second surface, if you will. Um, um, but we allowed the air to pass up in between, and then it had two more layers: a, 
uh, energy reducing film uh, and another uh, film on the inside of that to allow for the environmental control of the building. So we were trying to prove that you could live in a, a transparent plastic house uh, in, the, in the 21st century. And of course the stairs were, were to be made out of polycarbonate and lit and we uh, mocked those up uh, in our shop uh, and tested those and here they are uh, you know, as final proof of concept uh, uh, advancing the idea that you know you could have a polycarbonate bearing wall uh, that would take 700,000 uh, uh, visits through this particular house over the course of uh, five months over a polycarbonate stair and only have really a, one of the treads break. We had to go up there uh, early in the third week and we had a, a tegler end of one of the one of the treads separate uh, and, uh, and delaminate, and we had to uh, support that um, along the way. The bathrooms were uh, off-site fabricated here, um, but they became, a te the cellophane house became a test bed uh, for uh, a residence hall in Houston, Texas uh, at Rice University, um, where they were actually, these, these bathrooms were being made for uh, one of uh, Hopkins's projects. Uh, at that campus, and then of course refining the structural members of the of the of the frame. This moment connection uh, is steel. It's the third such moment connection that we've actually designed for these um, uh, uh, aluminum frames. They're all different. They're, they've all been patented, um, and they uh, you know they help transfer the loads into that frame, and they're specifically designed for. Uh, each and every one of those circumstances. And then the, the finalized assembly of one of the walls um, uh, uh, and part of the deck uh, at Coleman Industry. And here you see that, that chunking of those modules uh, before they're getting ready to ship uh, all in the factory. And then proofed again, they were lifted up and stacked so that we could see that they were coming together and they were fitted before they were unstacked and then placed on the truck and, and brought into Manhattan uh, and then picked uh, into place. And here's a, a roughly two and a half minute clip of those, those elements coming together. And you'll see a hiccup here in just a minute. There's the back stair coming into place. Um, you know, a series of uh, spatial modules uh, with a, as a kind of tabletop with a platform in between. And you'll see in just a minute, they've tarped this and then they'll re-guy this front. This, this bridge won't fit with the bathroom on it. And they set it down. Uh, and we see that we have a problem and you see them guy that front, that front member. And we found that one of the legs, while it fit in the, in the shop, was miscut. And when they put the uh, diagonal strut in to ship it, uh, it pulled the leg out of plumb by several millimeters. And so when they went to set it down, it wouldn't set. And so they didn't find that out until they went to put the bridge piece on it and they didn't have the piece set. So they, they kicked the diagonal member out um, and it sat down, recut a diagonal member uh, and allowed us to continue. And this all was seamless. Oh, what you're seeing right here is now in the fourth day. All of that stacked up in four days, two bathrooms part of a kitchen, all the stair, um, you know, the floor decks and so forth. Uh, and then now you're seeing uh, day seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, roughly 13, about now, 14. The kitchen pull in. So, 85% of the house was built in six days and virtually would have been occupiable had we left, had we put the rest of the uh, PET skin on the outside of it. Uh, it was wired, it was ready to go, um, but we had other things that we were loading into the, into the project, um, which took the additional eight days to complete the last 15%. So here it is, uh, you know, the inside of that interior, again, a kind of proof of concept but advancing the theory that both a polycarbonate floor, resin walls, translucent skins, um, 
you know, um, were habitable. Now you would say, well, how do you have proof that it was habitable because nobody lived in there? Well, we put monitors in the wall and we took, over the course of five months, took uh, air samples and data off of the uh, layers of the PET and inside the space. And you can see our target modeling of this naturally ventilated house um, in New York City at this time of year, um, you know, the baseline that we had imagined targeting that. And you can see where the actual data points um, brought, that, uh, brought that temperature. So we were well within that array um, uh, of that target. And it allowed us to understand that, um, you know, that environment was actually uh, occupiable and uh, provable. Now there are a whole other series of conversations on the blogs about this particular house, about you know living in a plastic house and living in New York City and how do you get dressed and you know all of those sorts of things. But you know there are plenty of glass buildings in New York City as well, and people don't pull the shades. So um, we didn't think that th those kinds of issues, those kinds of issues are going to continue with transparency going on, they aren't necessarily going to be solved by uh, a cellophane house. So this is about simulation as prototyping. We saw a snippet of this this afternoon, but this is a uh, India concept house or, or now called Ideal Choice Homes that we're working with a venture capitalist on in, in India. Um, a lot of the tier two, tier, tier three cities, there's a 25 million uh, how, uh, 25 million unit housing deficit in India. Um, and so trying to meet the middle class needs in India, middle class being roughly between 20 and $30,000 US dollar annual average income being the Indian middle class income. Trying to meet that price point is, as you can imagine, a true challenge, particularly since uh, that culture has such a, uh, um, you know, really interesting way of evaluating uh, construction. You know, they, they have what they call the knock test. So if you walk up to something and it sounds like that, they don't buy it. You know, if, if, if you walk up to something, you know, that sounds like that, they don't buy it. But if, it's, if you walk up to a concrete column and you knock on that, I'll take 10. So, you know, you can see the, the very small limitations on the range of materials that our research group uh, ultimately got to rather rapidly because of cultural influences on it, not some advancing theory of an architect saying, well, you know, we can, you know, we can ship space down to India out of the UK and solve this 25 million unit deficit and, and go away rich. I mean, this is a real problem because trying to think about how you're going to uh, make and ship something that sounds and acts solid and also has the thermal comfort in a tier two and tier three city uh, in India is, is, is quite um, challenging. So, you know, our process begins with a lot of whiteboarding and a lot of, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of getting all the factors, all the ingredients out on the table that are not about necessarily form making, but help to inform form making. And then there's some early, early test elements, often made out of foam and, and cardboard, as I said earlier, in the shop. But then moving back to the simulative models that allow us to understand in real time and in re with real environmental data um, how a wall, how a space, is going to perform, you know, doing point clouds in space, using uh, the researches that we have to be able to understand how you're going to be able to naturally ventil ventilate this particular structure and where are the problem areas in that chambered structure going to occur and do we have the right apertures, do we have the right a size apertures, do we have the, them placed properly, are we controlling them during, throughout the day properly, um, this is an average of the modeling over the, over the whole model, but you can see that the distribution um, actually works um, quite well. And then moving back to something that full scale mocks up, you know, the element, even though it's not mocking up the weight yet, it's mocking up something so that we can understand, can two people carry this, 
Can three people carry it? Does it have to be lifted by a crane? Um, and so forth. And then getting into uh, actually chunking and pouring you know, the elements of concrete using different mix designs. Uh, these are but one of 27 samples that we put together. Um, what's interesting about this is that we're doing a kind of thermal uh, uh, mapping of these panels at the same time, trying to understand what the modulation of those walls means in terms of both heat transfer and heat loss, and trying to find you know, the right optimization of, in this case, form, you know, de you know, dif you know um, dimpling the facade uh, to uh, enable us to get, not only take weight out of the panel, but also to um, get the right uh, relationship inside to outside during the course of a, uh, a series of seasons uh, in this space. And then, of course, once we know the size, we know the thickness, we know the weight, and we're finding how these elements are coming together, we map its weight, and we map um, um, how many people uh, you know, it might take to lift something. Um, and 13 people to lift a panel is a fail. You know? So this was a point of failure here. You know, our target was somewhere around six. Um, you know, our target was no crane you know, for a one-story house. Basically, that the, that the panels, you know, and so forth could be cast and trucked and done, but not having to have that specialized piece of equipment on site. But as we've refined that, we've taken weight out of it, and we've um, arrayed, you know, the elements, the components coming together. As you can see, they are um, been continuously reduced and refined, so they're down to a, a very, very simple series of kit, um, and then of course, you know, how the reinforcement's done and how it's then come together uh, in that construction assembly so that it doesn't require sophisticated construction techniques in order for somebody to put this together. Because you can imagine, you know, um, some common person in India going to their local version of, you know, whatever it is, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, you know, and being able to buy these panels and going back to their piece of property and being able to kit it together uh, if it's a one-story house. And that was, that was part of the goal and the target. So here's how this all comes together. Now, what I'm showing you here is actually uh, what's called a G plus one, G plus two, G plus four opportunity because we knew that we needed to have also scalability. So this is like the second version of this put, put together. You can see the kit um, coming together. I love the way this sort of rolls in on a, on a kind of di diaper here. It doesn't happen that way, you know, in construction. Um, but uh, so it's imagined as a one-story thing or a multi-story thing. It's imagined that it can be um, added to over time so that somebody can buy something quite small but not have to throw that away and ultimately make out a full kitted house um, or even add to it um, the other way. So we're, we're imagining how the modularity of these parts can all come together um, in the G plus three and G plus four. So here you see a truck you know, coming. Uh, these will magically fly off the truck um, uh, and a uh, you know, person standing there in great awe while they fly off the truck. Uh, they won't happen that way either. We haven't figured out levitation yet, but uh, um, we're working on that. Um, so they're, they're standing up. We imagine that you know four people, six people could actually tip these up, not unlike Stonehenge back in the day, I guess. Uh, um, but when you get to G plus two or G plus three, obviously it needs this more sophisticated piece of equipment, and we imagine that it's a developer or a real estate speculator that's actually, you know, that's actually, um, you know, putting those those pieces together. So that is about how, you know, just a snippet of simulation coming together to kind of prototype a model. I know I'm close on time, so I'm going to go through this last principle rather rapidly, but this is a new um, high rise in Philadelphia, one of several that we are currently working on. Um, 
But this is about how simulation can be informed by verification. And this is, I think, um, somebody this afternoon, um, uh, hold on a second, I'm sorry. It was James, I believe, you know, was, yeah, was talking about the kind of interface of understanding data, you know, inside to outside and the kind of, the, the pr prototyping technique of, 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 that, of that process of informing them over time of what, how something might, uh, might um, uh, perform. Uh, and that was a performative act uh, in, the, in, the, in its methodology along the way as well. We're very keen on getting that data early and often, and we're very keen on getting that data uh, in real time. And so one of the things that the research group has been working on is a real-time embodied energy calculator, which we're about ready to roll out um, and make available. And we also have developed a series of sensors that allow us to get in real time back through our iPhone and back to our computers um, data from not only existing buildings, but also from um, buildings adjacent to where we might put a building so that we have real-time micro uh, climate uh, energy models rather than relying upon AccuWeather uh, to give us that information. So with that, I'm out of time. I, I just have to uh, say that I'm, I'm deeply grateful for your attention. I think we need to think about prototyping in the context of how it's useful to us in advancing architecture and the social condition and the environmental condition. And in that end, I think our, you know, our environments, our cities, uh, and our buildings will all be better. Thank you all very much.